Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you having a fantastic Tuesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're going to talk about today is a story that's been requested for the past few days, and kind of on the surface level, it's a story that initially you could just see as drama. But really, when you look at it, there is more to it. There's commentary on what it means to overshare, where is the line in what you're filming and doing, and also the, the legal implications of things that you say in videos. And while there are other people involved, at the center of this story, you have three massive creators, both on platform and off platform. You've got Trisha Paytas, Jason Nash, and David Dobrin. And understand, I'm only gonna be sharing very small tidbits of the drama elements, just so you have some context. It appears that this situation started at the end of January when David posted a video with Trisha's boyfriend, Jason Nash. And the video includes a clip that is apparently three months old, where the two joke about Jason having a threesome with Trisha and another YouTuber, an infamous YouTuber, the brain trust behind TanaCon, Tana Mojo. If you can get Tana to have a three-way with me and Trisha, I'll do anything. I'll be your slave for a year. Are you serious? I'm dead serious. And then more recently, there's a video on February 2nd where David posted another video with both Jason and Tana. And in that video, Tana asks Jason why he wants to sleep with her, and David says it's because he likes broken girls. Jason agrees, and everyone has a laugh. But why me, Jason? You, you could have do better. Because he likes broken you girls. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true or true? Yeah, it's true. So then on Saturday, Trisha posted a 19 minute video on her channel called Why David Dobrik Is a Horrible Human Being. Also, do not worry, we're not gonna go point by point because there's a lot of stuff that doesn't matter. There are some main points, but I mean, no one's ever accused Trisha of being concise. So in this video, she's visibly crying. She's talking about how both David and Jason hurt her in those videos. She also says she's uncomfortable with those jokes, especially because of the age difference between her, Jason, and Tana. And for those who don't know, Tana is 20 years old. I just have always said repeatedly to David, repeatedly that I'm like, it's not a funny joke, it's not funny. And then they invited her over anyways and I was asleep, but I could kinda hear and her just being like, no, that's like gross, like no offense, but that's gross or whatever. And it's gross. Jason's 45, I'm 30, it's gross, it's gross. But you've also had fans pushing back against her, saying that she can dish it out, but not take it back. This because a near constant in the vlogs is Trisha joking about having sex with other people, including Jason's friends. Don't say anything weird to David while I'm inside. I'll try not to suck his dick. Are you trying to hook up with Zane while Jason's not here? <laughs> David, you yeah, it's getting David? really weird between Please. Why? So gross. He's like a cute little bunny. She also goes on to not only call David Dobrik a horrible person, but she makes a, a very interesting comparison. And I used to really love David. I used to think he was like so charming in the same way Ted Bundy was charming. <laughs> I guess, you know, I, everyone thought he was charming too. Who turned out to be a serial killer. So that was a thing that happened that was really special. And here's the thing, I mean, I think that there's a conversation to be had about vloggers or really any creator being different than the persona they put out. I think there's also a conversation to be had about what is included in a video and what people are comfortable with. And of course, in all of those situations, they're going to be different, but there's gonna be an interesting dynamic there because some people are gonna see it as exploiting others, pushing people too far, or is that part of the joke, right? How much of it is real, how much is fake? Also, when you have the likes of a David Dobrik, who I, I sometimes look at as a, a kingmaker, I mean, a lot of people around him for just the specific reason that they are around him in the videos and in his whole kind of ecosystem, they are massive. And that's not completely unique to David, right? You, you see kind of these, these circles of people that they, they get propped up because of an individual. I mean, you can look at the, the likes of Shane Dawson as an example as well. But when it comes to certain pieces of content like the ones that David Dobrik puts out where people are getting shot with paintball guns sometimes by people they don't know and insert a ton of really, really extra things, there's a conversation of people putting up with something they're maybe not okay with because it's ultimately beneficial for them. But looking from the outside in, we don't know the specifics of do people actually really feel like that? We have one person that in this video talking about it also referred to him as Ted Bundy, which side note, we saw all of your comments on last Friday's video saying that, you know, talking about a Ted Bundy, that shouldn't be the same as talking about a mass shooter, which of course, we still have that policy on this show of not naming and showing faces there. And I saw the validity in those arguments. So the people that, that gave kind of constructive criticism, thank you to the people that expressed that same point, but in an asshole way, uh, go fuck yourself. But to jump back into it, we do have one person Person that is saying this, but it's also the same person in this very long video who compared David Dobrik somewhat to Ted Bundy. And if anything, making that over the top comparison really makes me doubt the messenger. But ultimately, the final reason we're talking about this story, it ends up being one of the biggest parts of this story, even though in Trisha's video is one of kind of the smallest parts. She references this almost as if it's like a side point, but it's become the main focus. Trisha makes the very serious accusation that a member of this group, the member of the vlog squad by the name of Brandon Calvillo is dating or was with a Minor. Ultimately, with these accusations out there, Brandon then responded to Trisha's video tweeting, I just wanted to clear some comments that were
were made regarding me today and some assumptions that I've been getting for a while now. My girlfriend is currently 18 and we started dating when she was 18. She's about to turn 19. To be clear, we never dated when she was 17. Please be mindful of how hurtful and damaging your words can be. Thank you. His girlfriend Lacey also released a similar statement saying, in all seriousness, something was posted on social media regarding my relationship. Rest assured, what was posted is not factual and I was never in an inappropriate relationship with Brandon. We began dating when I turned 18 and I was a freshman in college. Brandon is a gentleman and we have a wonderful and personal relationship. Please know that words hurt and can be really damaging. But then you had people going back and pulling up some clips from one of David's vlogs that was posted on February 23rd, 2018. Her name's Lacey. She's 18, 19. You're like, I hope. So you've been seeing this girl for a month? Around a month, yeah. Is Brandon good at sex? Honestly, yeah. And people also started to dig through their social media accounts and other information available online. And there it appeared that people found that Lacey's birthday was in March of 2000, which if actually true, means she would have been 17 at the time they started dating, at least as far as what was in the video. And actually what we ended up seeing was that Lacey and Brandon ended up deleting their posts, with Brandon even deleting photos he had with her that were getting spammed with hate messages. Also, as far as deleted content, David deleted some videos. Trisha, of course, deleted her massive video, which was fantastic news for all of those channels, just re-uploading the entirety of those videos. And as of right now, nobody's really commented on this whole situation with most members posting videos as if nothing had happened. But ultimately that's where we are, this very weird, confusing situation. We don't know certain things definitively, like I don't have a birth certificate in hand, right? We only have to go off the information that's out there. Well, I think most people would understand why David would delete his videos, why Trisha would delete her video. There is the question around the reason that Brandon and Lacey deleted their claims that this was not true. Also connected to the story is part of this being, uh, people don't know what to believe and if, if, if this could be even a PR stunt. And I personally believe that in no way is this a PR stunt. I mean, that would be that would be one of the most idiotic moves ever. I mean, they're all at a place where they have fantastic numbers and no one wants to associate this with their name, even if it's like, ha we gotcha, gotcha. No, it's just something out there that damages your name. But ultimately it looks like, at least at this part, we're dealing with a situation where someone is lying. Trisha makes this very large claim around a legal situation that that it's, it's very hard to see it as, oh yeah, maybe she misremembered since she says that she has this whole conversation with David Dobrik. But at the same time, we don't know if David was just messing with her if certain things are filmed for the vlog just to kind of fit some sort of storyline. Yeah, ultimately that's the situation as it is right now. There were there were some outlets that had been looking at this story. Now it's been picked up by Newsweek. It will be interesting to see if this story picks up even more steam. As far as audience reaction, it appears that David Dobrik has been somewhat unaffected. In fact, most of the top comments on his most recent video since all of this have been, yay, Trish is gone. As far as Brandon's concerned, I mean, if you go to any picture on his Instagram, there, there are comments constantly referencing what's happening. But yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see what happens from here. And of course, like with everything we talk about, I'd love to know your thoughts on this. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today and today in Awesome brought to you by SeatGeek. And while they're there in general, if you're stressing about a Valentine's Day gift, SeatGeek is there to help. You wanna make it a special day, a memorable one, then give the gift of a live experience. If you didn't know, SeatGeek is a ticket app that takes confusion out of buying tickets for live events, from concerts to comedy shows to sporting events to whatever. They put all the tickets in one place, they give them a zero to 100 score so you know if you're getting a good deal or not. And of course, as I always mentioned, they're not just a sponsor. This is an app that I have on my phone that I personally use. Well, you can definitely use this for events down the road. For me, it's kind of a last minute, oh, let's do something together. And then I personally end up feeling like hero for the day rather than, oh, look, dad forgot to plan anything for the weekend because he's married to his job. And best of all, for all you beautiful bastards, you will get $20 off your first ticket purchase if you use code Phil. So just head on over to SeatGeekPhil.com or just click the link in the description down below. Download the app and make sure to enter in code Phil to save. And the first bit of awesome is a reminder slash notification. If you didn't know, this morning we posted an extra morning news deep dive. It's on a topic that we're gonna be hearing about more and more and more as the days and months and years go on. And yeah, just remember on Tuesdays and Thursday mornings, you're also getting those extra videos. Then <laughs> Netflix gave us You Without Joe's voiceover, which side note, I personally think is a fantastic series. If you haven't watched it yet, I recommend it. Also season two, oh, I'm excited. Then we have Binging with Babish giving us spaghetti tacos for my Carly. We got the Honest trailer for Happy Death Day. Then we got a really interesting video from Trace Dominguez about the dead animals you see in those museums. You know, those museums you go to. We got the official trailer for Larry Charles's Dangerous World of Comedy. We had Gus Johnson giving us How Did They Mess Up the Super Bowl Halftime Show. And remember, if you wanna see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then let's talk about the update around Fuck Jerry and Jerry Media. So yesterday we talked about the immense backlash against Fuck Jerry and Jerry Media in general. Right, just a lot of regular people and writers and comedians angry that their content was constantly 
intentionally being stolen by Fuck Jerry, also monetized by the same company. Meanwhile, the person that actually made the original content got nothing. There's also, of course, the mention of the company's ties to Fire Festival and promoting it and then making a documentary about it afterwards. But one of the dumbest updates, and I mean, I mean, dumbest as far as Fuck Jerry is concerned. Among the many people calling out the company, you had a guy by the name of Vic Berger. He had previously shared a screenshot of his interaction with Fuck Jerry's chief content officer. He says, hey, either delete my Ted Cruz video or give me credit, what the fuck, man? To which Crispy Shorts, AKA James Ryan Oliger, responded, shut up. Well, he provided an update yesterday thanks to screenshots on Twitter, where he wrote, fuck Jerry doesn't like it when other people use their content. Please download my fuck Jerry video and re-upload anywhere and everywhere you can. Thank you. Then linking to a video on Vimeo, which I'm going to include in the description down below as well. And then in that tweet, providing screenshots of what appears to be his YouTube account, where his video, Fuck Jerry, Easier to Steal, has been hit with a copyright takedown request by user Crispy Shorts yesterday. And then providing a picture of the Fuck Jerry team. And of course, as you know, but for some reason other people don't know, when you try to stop something from getting out by using the copyright system, you all but guarantee that thing blowing up. And so what we saw was this Vimeo video just blowing up, going to the front page of Reddit, even still 17 hours after, as one of the top three videos on our videos. And so ultimately you're dealing with a situation that if this is in fact the same person that works for this company, one, the situation is blown up in their face. Also, when I tried to go to the Fuck Jerry Twitter account to see if they confirmed or denied that they were behind this, I couldn't see because they had that account private. Same as Crispy Shorts's Instagram account. Because this is the internet, there is always a chance that something was kind of false flag. But also, if this was then, this seems like one of the biggest hypocritical moves ever. Right? You essentially have a whole business model that is taking the original work of someone else and then just throwing it up on your page. And all of a sudden you allegedly have that company taking a swing at someone criticizing them by taking their clips and arguably transforming it into its own mocking piece, whether it be with captions or editing. So all of this has really done is it gave this story even stronger legs. Now with that said, for all the people saying, yeah, shut down, fuck Jerry, I really don't believe that this is going to happen. Unless this continued for a much, much longer period of time and you just made them even more toxic, uh, I think that they're going to be fine. I think that's because your common, everyday, normie, kind of just scrolling through the internet does not care about the, the behind the scenes nature of who's feeding them memes. There's the movement now, there's the mockery now, there's the pulling back of sponsors, but I mean, you're aware of the news cycle. There's a new thing every 20 minutes. Yeah, ultimately that's where we are with this one right now. And of course, as always, I'd love to know your thoughts around it. And then, I wanted to talk about this yesterday, but the show was already too long. I was sick, it was it was all late. We need to talk about the situation out of Virginia with Democrat Governor Ralph Northam. If you didn't see, back on Friday, there was an article published on a website called Big League Politics, alleging that Virginia's Democrat Governor Ralph Northam had posed for a blackface picture. And the picture was reportedly found on Northam's yearbook page from Eastern Virginia Medical School, where he graduated in 1984. And this article contained the yearbook page in question and stated Northam and a friend were photographed together, one in blackface, one in clan robes. And it wasn't just this one site. Shortly after the article was published, the photo was verified by other news sources. And as far as Northam's reaction, it is a roller coaster ride. He initially responds with a written statement saying, I am deeply sorry for the decision I made to appear as I did in this photo and for the hurt that decision caused then and now. He then essentially goes on to say that this is not who he is today. He references his career in the military, in medicine, and in public service, and adding, I recognize that it will take time and serious effort to heal the damage this conduct has caused. That same day, he decides to release a video statement and apology, and this is what that looks like. That photo and the racist and offensive attitudes it represents does not reflect that person I am today or the way that I have conducted myself as a soldier, a doctor, and a public servant. I am deeply sorry. I cannot change the decisions I made, nor can I undo the harm my behavior caused then and today. But I accept responsibility for my past actions and I am ready to do the hard work of regaining your trust. But then on Saturday, Northam does something that I really didn't expect given the two previous statements. He pulls a shaggy. It wasn't me. Yes, really. He says he believes it wasn't him. Yesterday, I took responsibility for content that appeared on my page in the Eastern Virginia Medical School yearbook that was clearly racist and offensive. I am not and will not excuse the content of the photo. It was offensive, racist, and despicable. When my staff showed me the photo in question yesterday, I was seeing it for the first time. I did not purchase the EVMS yearbook, and I was unaware of what was on my page. When I was confronted with the images yesterday, I was appalled that they appeared on my page, but I believe then 
and now that I am not either of the people in that photo. And if you're watching that, you're like, well, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. He's out here trying to gaslight everybody. He actually said, when I was confronted with the images yesterday, I was appalled that they appeared on my page, but I believe then and now that I'm not either of the people in that photo. But in your first statement, you literally say, I am deeply sorry for the decision I made to appear as I did in this photo and for the hurt that decision caused then and now. What you talking about, Ralph? Also in that Saturday press conference, it appeared that he tried to get in front of another story where he darkened his face. That same year, I did participate in a dance contest in San Antonio in which I darkened my face as part of a Michael Jackson costume. It is because my memory of that episode is so vivid that I truly do not believe I am in the picture in my yearbook. And I gotta say, his first statement still undoes any excuse that he can throw out there now. In my mind, the only way he releases that first statement, and it's also not him, in that photograph is that there are so many other photographs of all the other times that he went in blackface that he was like, oh yeah, that was probably me. And he didn't look at the actual photo in question, but once again, I highly doubt that. But that said, then of course, let's talk about the response. Following both the initial article and Northam's statements, there were numerous calls for him to resign and let the Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax take over as governor. And these calls for Northam to step down have come from both parties, with the ones getting the most attention being from Democrats. You're the likes of local Virginia politicians and political organizations like the chair of the Democratic Party of Virginia who said in a statement, we stand with Democrats across Virginia and the country calling him to immediately resign. He no longer has our confidence or our support. With Hillary Clinton tweeting, this has gone on to long, there is nothing to debate, he must resign. Former VP Joe Biden tweeting, there is no place for racism in America. Governor Northam has lost all moral authority and should resign immediately. And yet Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer. Head of the Democratic National Committee Tom Perez. And the list goes on and on and includes Democratic candidates for president. But despite calls for resignation from Republicans and Democrats, Northam has refused to step down. Yesterday we saw Northam hold separate meetings with his cabinet and staff, some of whom reportedly urged him to quit. And in those meetings with his cabinet, Northam reportedly said he wanted time to clear his name and would remain in office for now. But the thing is, that's not the only scandal in Virginia right now. We have now also seen an accusation come out about Lieutenant Governor Fairfax. On Sunday, Big League Politics released another article that stated a woman named Vanessa Tyson accused Fairfax of sexually assaulting her in 2004 at the Democratic National Convention. And according to that article, a friend of Tyson sent Big League Politics a screenshot of a private Facebook post she had made where she describes her attacker as an office holder who is about to get a, quote, very big promotion. Now, immediately following the article's publication, Fairfax issued a statement on Twitter are denying these allegations and stating, tonight an online publication released a false and unsubstantiated allegation against Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax. The person reported to be making this false allegation first approached the Washington Post more than a year ago, around the time of the Lieutenant Governor's historic inauguration. The Post carefully investigated the claim for several months and adding after being presented with facts consistent with the Lieutenant Governor's denial of the allegation, the absence of any evidence corroborating the allegation, and significant red flags and inconsistencies within the allegations, the Post made the considered decision not to publish the story. Also on that note, the Washington Post expanded on the accusations in an article saying that during the convention, Fairfax and the accuser, they made her feel comfortable enough to walk up to his hotel room with him to grab some papers. The woman claimed they began kissing consensually and then Fairfax used his strength to force her to perform oral sex on him. Fairfax, who was not married at the time, claimed that the encounter was consensual. However, the Washington Post did not agree with Fairfax's staff's description of events saying, Fairfax and the woman told different versions of what happened in the hotel room with no one else present. The Post could not find anyone who could corroborate either version. Also writing, the Post did not find, quote, significant red flags and inconsistencies within the allegations as the Fairfax statement incorrectly said. And just this morning, we saw reports of Vanessa Tyson has retained the law firm Katz, Marshall, and Banks and is consulting them about next steps. Which is of note because they also recently represented Christine Blasey Ford, who of course is the woman who accused now Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh of sexual assault in the high profile case back in September. And ultimately, that is where we are right now. It's gonna be interesting to see what happens next. Do we see Ralph step down? What happens with this scandal and accusations? Do we see more evidence come forward? But ultimately, like I always try to do, I want to pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts around this situation? What do you think about the admission, then denial, the other scandal, all of it together? Any and all thoughts, let me know in those comments down below. And that's where I'm going to end today's show. And remember, if you like this video, you like the way we cover news, let us know. Hit that like button. Also, if you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Maybe ring that bell to turn on notifications. YouTube's even worked on a new feature where sometimes they even work, which is impressive. Also, remember, if you missed yesterday's Philip DeFranco show, this morning's Extra News Deep Dive, you can click or tap right there to watch those. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you tomorrow.